So, uh, can we start, ma? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm just uh, putting this session on record, and also it has already started streaming live on uh, YouTube. Yeah. Yes. Good morning, Mahesh, sir. Morning, Madhumati. How are you? Fine, sir. Therefore, you need to call me back there, Professor. I have many old friends in your campus. Should we begin, sir? Yeah, I'm yeah. ready. Yeah, sure. A very good morning to one and all present here. This is the second session of the guest lecture on the topic, the practice of architecture. Our guest today is no stranger to the Spark School of Architecture. It's none other than architect L. Venkatesh. Welcome to WeSpark once again, sir. Thank you. We are happy to have you here today. I welcome our beloved director, Dr. Jafar A. Khan, to this lecture. He is also going to moderate the discussion that follows the lecture. A warm welcome to all the faculty members present here and, of course, our student friends. I now invite Nandana to introduce our guest speaker, architect N. Venkatesh, to the audience. Good morning to one and all present here. Architect L. Venkatesh has nearly 30 years under his belt as an architect in the architecture, engineering and construction industry, where he designed and managed large-scale construction projects. He spent most of that time at CRN, a well-known Indian design firm, where he worked on several high-visibility projects for companies such as Oracle, Nokia, Dell Computers and CA Technology, as well as several sports facilities, including a Cricket World Cup stadium in the West Indies. He has a master's degree in architecture from Iowa State University and a bachelor's from IIT Roorkee. After active designing over the years, he shifted his focus to digital delivery and technology at the intersection of drawing board and site. He is also the director of integrated digital delivery at Invicara, which is a platform for digital buildings. He has been a visiting faculty at VSPARC VIT, guiding us right from the beginning and is no stranger to us. A very warm welcome to you, sir. It's always a privilege having you with us. Thank you, Nandana. I now request our guest speaker to begin his presentation. Before that, I request all the participants to stay on mute. You may please send in your questions in the chat window, which will be taken up later during the discussion session. Over to you, sir. Thanks, all of you, my friends at uh, Park. Professor Jaffer, I think you need, my, my feet are itching to travel, so once campus opens, I hope you will call me back. I would uh, love to be back among my friends out there, <clears throat> and uh, also the students. I believe that today's talk is on professional practice, and it's a module for professional practice, so I'm going to talk to you about life in general, okay? because that's what it's all about. It's going to be a freewheeling talk. I'm not going to be talking about my project. I'm happy to answer questions about it. But I'm going to try to talk about what drives a good practice and what drives a good individual passion for practice. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm also going to talk about three significant what I call failures in my life because I think these three failures taught me more than any, any, any success could have taught me. And uh, I've blanked out some names from these slides, right? I don't want anybody showing me for it. So uh, names have been blanked out. But uh, let's dive right into the presentation. Um, you see my screen? Do you all see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So I'm calling this talk today forgetting to remember. I have given this name for a reason that a couple of my projects on which I put a lot of passion, effort, and energy were either demolished or modified later without my consent. This is what I call a kind of a failure, but it's actually... I wouldn't even call it a failure. These are like really important projects for me to understand what practice is all about. Now, uh, 
uh, I don't know. Does, does anybody know what this building is? Any quick answers? Or where this is? It's in Delhi. Yeah, correct. Uh, this is the... Any guess on what the building is? Rebound, I guess. Uh, kind of close by. One thing about Delhi is it's easy to just say it's a bhavan. Because most buildings there are bhavans. You know, this is uh, Krishi, Krishi Bhavan. Just right opposite rail bound. Good guess. Whoever it is, who guessed that, uh, I think deserves a bonus <laughs> for this course. Definitely. Yeah. Now, uh, why I put this is, this is one of the buildings that's going to be demolished uh, soon. And I put this building not because I had anything to do with it, except that I like this building. But I, I used to go into this building very frequently over the last 10 years because one of my clients was sitting out there. And, uh, you know, as much as this looks grand and uh, beautiful, the inside of the building is a complete mess. This building was designed for an India, for a government, for a bureaucracy of the 50s, which was predominantly a largely British legacy. It's hardly designed inside to meet the aspirations of, of an India. So I'm, I'm not getting into the politics of whether it should be retained or demolished or whatever. This is not what I'm talking about, but I'm just saying that soon this building may be history. And speed makes us forget on how to remember. We may shed a few tears here and there for this now, but we will soon forget about it and move on. So before I move to the next slide, does anybody know who the architect of this was? No, no negative points, so you can guess. Okay, I'm going to wait for five more seconds. And Probably one of those early CPWD guys. Or... Uh, well, close, but not quite. So since you, you didn't say it, uh, Professor Jaffer will deduct one point for you. you know? <laughs> the, <laughs> because and... this, this, big, this building was recently in news. Yeah. Uh, so you know. This was done by, designed by a great, great person. It's one of, the, one of the architects who I deeply admire and respect. A man, a great man called Habib Rahman. Habib Rahman studied at, uh, at MIT and once he met uh, Jawaharlal Nehru in the US and Nehru told him, what are you young men doing in the US? You should be back in India. And he came back. And so to the extent that you said CPWD kind of right because he was one of the early architects out there, but he had his own practice. He did a lot of beautiful uh, uh, buildings. And the two the three most beautiful structures of Habib Rahman that I like, which you guys should go back and look at, is one is the memorial for President uh, Zakir Hussain, which is near the Jamia Milia campus. The second one is the memorial for President uh, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmad. The third one is something called the Ganga Ghats uh, in, in, uh, in Patna, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Three extremely beautiful structures. Habib Rahman is a great guy. His son is Ram Rahman, who's a famous photographer. So he's re recently brought out a book of uh, photographs of uh, uh, Habib Rahman. Definitely worth looking at. So now coming back to this, this building will soon be memory, but memory is not what it... Just tell be. me, uh, his, daughter, his daughter is uh, Sandhya, who runs a dance school in New York. Correct, correct, exactly. Yeah. His wife was uh, Indrani Rahman. She was a famous dancer herself. And uh, Miss India representative in... Uh, universe for the first time in 1962. Very beautiful lady, yeah, yeah. married and represented. Very. Habib Brahman himself, unfortunately, had a kind of a sad end to his life. He was also a very famous photographer. So when once he was doing some photography at, uh, at the Jamia campus, he stepped back without realizing that he was on, a, on an edge. And he fell down about 15 or 16 feet and broke his spine and spent the last years of his life for a bit in a very sad uh, end to a great man's uh, life. So now I'm going to talk today about some values which should ideally drive your passion and your practice. Okay. And let me just tell you one thing, right? Today we are seduced by technology. You now everything that we do, we want instant gratification. Right? Now I'm from a, from a generation even 25 years ago making a phone call from Chennai to Velour was a headache because you didn't have a proper connection to make a phone call. I don't even know how many of you remember the damn rotary dials. So it's, it, it was like a mess. So the India that you kids know today is 
vastly different from where uh, someone like Professor Jaffer and me uh, grew up. So our lives are at least minus a lot slower. And I, I remember things, I remember crazy things, okay? You can wake me up in the middle of my sleep and ask me who was the first president of Ghana. And without opening my eyes, I'll tell you it's Kwame Kumra. There's a road in Delhi named after Kwame Kumra, okay? But today Kwame Kumra is like, Nobody, nobody even cares. Nobody even knows where Ghana is. A lot of people don't know where Ghana is. So, you know, I'm from a kind of a different uh, timeline. I still don't have a flat screen in my in my house, so I, I I am completely blind to Netflix. So that should kind of tell you where I come from, right? Anyhow, <laughs> so so this is one. This empty slide kind of tells you about how I feel often about architecture. Now, this was an old dilapidated building once upon a time. And this was also the city office of a very large corporate of India. It is a completely ugly building. So sometime in 2000, in, uh, 2000 I was talking to the, uh, the CFO of that company. And this, that ugly building was where he was sitting. And I said like, how, how, how come you guys who are like at the front line of an international India, you guys are representative of, of, of a confident India stepping out onto the world. How come you guys sit in such an ugly building? And then he said, yeah, you know, we need to do something about it. So I actually kind of renovated that building completely, right? Completely refurbished it, had a fantastic roof garden, the whole building. We basically changed, we took an old, I used to say we took, an old woman and converted her into a bride, a young bride. But uh, I kind of realized also that it's kind of a very general, gender abrasive these days. So I'll change it. I, I, I took an old man and converted him into a young strapping athlete. That's what we did. But then the world changed so fast that in 10 years, that building had no use to them. They had their own new campus and the size of this building and the lack of flexibility was such that they kept it empty for five years before they said, God damn it, let's just break it down. So to me, this empty site is actually filled with some sadness because there's something that I put so much effort into and so much passion into is nothing. But at the same time, this also shows up to me as an empty slate, which means the potential for something new out here is infinite and endless. So it's really a question of how you look at it, right? The half empty, half full, half full glass syndrome. But what is actually like a disappointment for me, the other side of the coin is pregnant possibilities. So that kind of sets the tone of how you ought to look at life and practice. If something doesn't happen the way you want it, that's not the end of the story. You don't, you don't get upset about it or you don't get emotional about it you just move on because that was not meant to be and the other side of it is immense possibilities this is again another example this is a very very old and respected uh, uh, Tamil Nadu based uh, global entity they were big into a lot of things including like uh, automobile retail and they started building this particular building. I cannot tell you how much of trouble I had to pull out certain old established concepts. I mean, the the, the thing that I remember from this building, but designing it is like we, we put up a, an acoustic mineral fiber tile fall ceiling. And the guy came in, the chief manager of construction came in. He looked at it and he started screaming at me. He said, what is this nonsense you put out here? So I told him it's called an acoustic mineral fiber tile and it's a, it's a false ceiling. He says, that is not what we want. Our false ceiling is sturdy. All our false ceilings have a, have a MS frame and it is made out of plywood. And I said, so why would that be? He said, because we need to walk over the false ceiling. So I asked him, what is the reason for anyone wanting to walk over the false ceiling? He says, that's why it's called false ceiling. If it is not meant to be walked on, why would anyone call it a ceiling? It would have had a different name. And this particular tree, tree that you see out here, I kind of take pride in this tree. It's a rain tree. It's now about maybe 25, 
30 years old they actually wanted to cut this tree down right and this is one of the few leftover trees on mount road the very few trees on mount road and this is one of the few trees there and they said we want to cut this tree down and i said why why would anyone want to cut a tree down they said because it harms the view to my glass automobile showroom and I, i mean the kind of fight that i had to save this tree was incredible and finally i don't know it, uh, i don't know how it managed to survive uh, the good karma of the tree or my good karma but someone came in and said that's fine if this guy wants a tree let it be there you know and i could kind of snidely hear him say we can always cut it after it goes out from the side but luckily this kind of tree has survived but why i show this is before because when i designed it you know this kind of a one story building you know this was the building line this was the building line the big horizontal line that you see when uh, i designed it but soon enough without telling me they just used the old drawings and they constructed uh, a floor right above that themselves without consulting me now then again i went into a bit of a, a depression i said like what the heck you know how come they don't call me back and ask me what's going on but then i kind of realized that probably the building has a life and character of its own and this was a dialogue between the owner and the building so you design a building you imbibe it with certain characters and certain features and then the building takes upon a life of its own the building gets into a dialogue with its occupant and owner and then the building evolves which also fine with me right i was i was just kind of glad that there's a building and they didn't break it down they didn't do anything nasty with it but the building grew It's something like bringing up a kid you kind of want the kid to be something but the kid has a mind of its own and the kid grows up i know the day as long as the kid is good and fine we have no problem right i mean we don't know we don't mind what it does like i stopped asking my son what he does anymore so i like as long as you're okay i'm fine as long as you're doing nothing stupid and the building didn't look do anything stupid i mean the building was just kind of reacting to what its present owner wanted which is fine with me so i took that up and kind of left it as it is but the one that really the, the building that really bothered me was this building right this is on mount road again and this is a building for a company a government of india company and you know they bought this building with the site it's kind of a completely horrible building so for a long for the longest time i was kind of ashamed to even tell people that i designed this facade the problem is that these double arches these windows everything was there we couldn't touch it because the government of india owns this building and the building has a value so you can't demolish this building right but except that these guys wanted this building to look like the headquarters building in calcutta the headquarters building in calcutta was a colonial building so they wanted this exactly like that colonial building so you guys won't believe it i actually went back to my history books and opened up to find out and started sketching you know doric order ionic order corinthian order and this and that and you know these little things out here this pediment and then these little dots which are called gutte and believe me there is no single architecture term that i hate as much as gutte because this damn gutte in the pediment with this corinthian order is something that i get completely irritated with okay? i mean nothing if you just want to irritate me just come dressed up like a gutte in front of me and i i swear it i'll lose it on the other hand there's this one really nice word and i think you guys should all do research on what that word is and submit it to your teachers and if you submit it then you will get a bonus point for this course and that's a word word called the squinch find out what the squinch is and go tell your teachers and to me as much as the word gutte irritates me the word squinch makes me fall in love with whoever uses that word so i actually sat and did all this corinthian greenian and all these things you know you see the perfect i mean even the greeks couldn't have done such a perfect corinthian uh, column in the 20th century we did all these things but an absolutely amazingly ugly building and you know the thing that kind of bothers me really is that i took so much effort on it so if you look at it the front had this pediment the side had two smaller pediments i was very very faithful to the principles of architecture history of architecture in an utterly meaningless way i tried to tell the clients i said look here guys you have a cantilever beam coming out this cantilever beam is kind of projecting out from this tie beam it's so ugly you really ought to be 
demolishing this building. If you drop a plumb line from this thing out here, that plumb will actually fall on Mount Road. It will fall on the tarred blacktop road. That that is how much of violation this building had. But too bad. You had to live with it. And when you live with it, you try to do a good job with it. So it's a bad building with the best Corinthian column detailing that anyone can see in the 20th century. And I'll stop my my crypt story with this building. When I was designing this building with uh, with, with somebody else. Again, I'll, I'll just kind of hide this slide because I don't want you to be seeing it too much. I'll come back to it. So when I was designing this building, I used to keep having a sense of deja vu. I mean, everybody liked the concept of the building, but every time I was doing it, something on the drawing, I just kept having a, a disturbing sense of saying that, hey, the I mean, there's a lot of details here that I seem to know from before, maybe from a past birth, but I don't know what the hell these details are. And there was a time that I was getting married. So my brother who was in the US was coming for my marriage and he said, do you like any gift from here? So I said, yeah, get me a book on Louis Khan. My library doesn't have a book on Louis Khan. And my brother gifted me a book on Louis Khan. And uh, just after my marriage, this building was still going on the time. I uh, opened the book and like a slap on my face, the details were kind of ripped off, I'll say, from, from Louis Khan. So, you know, uh, it's just that you... The Louis Kahn details were in my memory, deeply ingrained. And I was looking at it and I couldn't remember it and connect it. But when I opened the book, the, the penny dropped. So what is the architecture then all about? It's kind of about certain values. But to me, uh, I'll come to those values. But you know, one of the happy, the two happy moments of my life, I'll tell you about it, two happy stories. Now this is Tidal Park and this is the Government of Tamil Nadu website, okay? And this particular strip has been constant on the government of Tamil Nadu website for the last almost for 15, 20 years, which means that regardless of what the government is, you will see farmers, you will see dance, you will see Mahabalipuram, and you'll see Tidal Park. And for me, it's a matter of personal pride that there's this great monument, a world heritage site designed by a great king 700, 800,000 years ago, and a building that I worked on, uh, designed by my firm right next to it. With this tidal park. I was once driving down from Tirunal Valley to uh, from Madurai to Tirunal Valley, or I don't know from Tirunal Valley to Kanyakumari or something like that. And you know, you you get some very beautiful vistas of the uh, Western Ghats out there. Some really beautiful sights. So another you know, taxi driver for some reason stopped. Now he didn't know me. He was a stranger to me, right? The taxi driver. He stopped the car and he pointed to the hills and said, sir, you can take some nice photos out here because he saw my camera. No? So it, he, I did that. And then he looked at me and said, sir, in the site, Lada, tidal park, Varapur. So I said, great. My wife was kind of, you know, she sat up like lightning struck her. She said, how does this guy know that you designed tidal park? I said, he doesn't know I designed tidal park. Then I said, why is he telling you that? I said, ask him. So she asked that guy, what does tidal park have to do with you? And he said, madam, in go to tidal park vanda means if a tidal park, I don't know all the students are Tamil or where they are from, so let me keep it in English. So he basically said, Madam, if a tidal park comes out here, my son can work in Madurai itself and he doesn't have to go out looking for a job. My son can stay with me and look after me in my old age and still have a good livelihood. It was an amazing expectation of hope engendered by a building. So for me, this building symbolizes hope, just like this building. So this building is actually the, the Cochin Stadium, the Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium in Cochin. And when we were designing this, one day, I was just before the inauguration, I was standing somewhere here on this top row. And the, uh, you know, there were two or three uh, important citizens of uh, Cochin, whom the uh, GCDA, the people that were developing the stadium had brought some of the uh, important citizens of uh, Cochin to see the stadium. And one of those was a gentleman who was a publisher of the Malayalam Manorama. And he kind of looked at me and said, you know, this is fabulous. We never thought this will ever get built. This gives so much hope. And he told me that I hope finally India starts winning international football competitions. And, you know, for me, that statement was so nice to hear because uh, a building that you, you design creates hope for people. And trust me, 
it is not how many likes you have on your instagram page you are building or how many people like your uh, things on facebook or give positive comments or where things get published that is not important if one person gets hope and inspired by a building you design there is no bigger joy and happiness that's when you really feel fulfilled so what are these values that i cherish one is silence which basically means that you are able to be in touch with yourself and not distracted by the clutter around you that is so important for memory so this slide represents silence the next value is intimacy this tree cantilevering out onto the arabian sea shows me intimacy with nature intimacy with land intimacy with sea but still a lurking sense of danger this tree can fall down any time right just look at the way it's cantilevered out so there is a great hope in this but also a great risk and we got to believe in that hope while keeping track of risk to move forward the third one is infinity every moment in life every project that you do every single detail is pregnant with infinite possibilities don't look at anything as too small or too less or too large do not disregard anything if the smallest of things the smallest of act acts which can create the greatest of change and positive hope and always look for that nowness if you're not able to find it anywhere else in the world it is probably there in your own neighborhood so this 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 image of somebody's terrace garden was truly inspiring for me because they just kind of taken up i mean this is like a terrace garden i can't believe it it just kind of looks like a like a forest outside so that intimacy and nowness so what are the values that i have cherished in the course of my practice is like silence intimacy with distance infinity nowness and hope with these i think i've had a fairly successful innings and now i'm happy to answer your questions i've come to the end of my presentation thank you thank you sir for that wonderful presentation uh, jaffer sir uh, you may now take over for the discussion so you're on mute uh, yes uh, i think it was uh, absolutely stunning talk by architect um, um el vengtesh and he certainly deserves a phd for his kind of uh, uh expression of ideas especially pertaining to architecture and his love for the trees in a dense urban uh, situation particularly on the mount road i don't know which part of mount road it was but uh i i mean i'm a lover of a tree so i took a lot of effort to save my avocado in bangalore because the neighbor was uh, the branches were coming into his backyard and it was the leaves are falling in so uh then you know we had to chop the branch and then i had to talk to the tree and i told him not to go that side come on to my terrace so actually the tree listened to me so he never went again back to the backyard i mean this is this is what i've been observing that tree i haven't seen it since since pandemic started so probably 25 30 years maybe 30 years since 1990 i planted it in 1990 it started giving fruits uh, used to get 300 400 avocados we used to distribute that street in indranagar uh there's another tree jacaranda right in front of my house and my neighbor was help bent on cutting it luckily the tree had grown uh, more than 4 inches in girth and then i told him if you cut it you will be in jail is it what the forest law in karnataka says that any tree which is more than 4 inches in girth cannot be tree cannot be cut you have to get permission from the forest department so uh, you must visit my home in velor i have about 15 trees i keep talking to them they love me a lot they 
uh, especially I have a mango, I have a, a coconut, and I have a, a date palm tree, which is there for I think probably 100 years now. She must be 100 years old. And she yields, uh, you know, we call it Ichamaram in Tamil. You know, it's actually, uh, uh, people don't keep Icham Ichamaram in their house because it's a, a, it's not a, a good sign, they say. But I insisted on that tree and I preserved the tree and the entire architecture uh, texture of the house. If you look at it, it's like actually inspired uh, by this tree because yeah, that be kind of. Uh, 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 and uh, so, uh, what is the uh, thing is that it's uh, uh, among your projects, it's, uh, uh, it's wonderful uh, to see the, you know, the stadium and. Um, usually when it comes to a stadium projects, like, you know, um, the architects go, you know, like overboard. It's like doing excessive things. You know, what happened in this Qatar stadium, football stadium that is being done and many more stadiums that we do. But I think this stadium is absolutely so simple. I never seen such a simple stadium in my life and so subtle and the roof line roof is like, I think it's very, uh, Kerala contextual stuff and uh, a very lightweight structure and so simple and I'm, I'm actually reminded of uh, Kenga Kuma or for that matter Shigeru Ban um, who have uh, go very close to uh, uh, you know that kind of um, intervention into this uh, uh, a, a, a kind of a, uh, architecture that they practice is so real, and I find I find that stadium was absolutely fascinating. So it was wonderful to have you here. Uh, um, um, I should call you Professor Venetish, and uh, it would be uh, absolutely uh, a fantastic uh, uh, um, to have you in V Spark in future. We are also. Are looking very closely to uh, discuss on visiting professor of practice in future. We are very keen to discuss that with many architects, including you. Um, thanks for reminding me. We will certainly come back to you on that. And, um, and, and it's wonderful uh, to see that uh, how you have uh, expressed your feeling towards uh, uh, some of those actual uh, things that happen to you in practice, some sort of a frustration at the same time, the happiness that comes up and, you know, the kind of uh, talking about the Corinthian column of that particular building. I don't know where it is. Is it in Mount Road or somewhere? I don't know. Uh, well, I haven't seen that building. Uh, uh, so those kind of, uh, uh, you know, Greco-Roman detailing, especially adopted by the uh, colonial architecture, uh, because they did not have a language of their own. So when they came to India, the colonists, they actually developed the language of their own, which was very contextual to India. And they called it later as an Indo-Saracenic architecture. So you can actually see that happening in Senate House. You have a high court buildings and then the GPO and many more buildings, which were built on that kind of a language, which integrated three different cultures together into a building. In fact, it was the precursor to this was the Mughal architecture. So if you look at Fatehpur Sikri or any one of this uh, later Mughal architecture, you will find how uh, uh, the local regional elements were integrated into architecture. For example, the Chhatris. Uh, for example, the, the construction of this beautiful uh, domes, the finials, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what do you call the kalasas into most of these uh, buildings were totally Indian, including the materiality was Indian. So, uh, so of course, the colonists at the end of it, H.R. Chisom and all those people came in and, you know, we have some wonderful architecture. If you come to Vellore, I'll take you on a tour because the early military architecture, because of this uh, early East Indian company guys actually did don't, didn't know what to do. So they employed the military engineers to, I mean, the company engineers to build something. So we have some very interesting bungalows actually. Uh, in Valor. And it's so wonderful to hear from you um, on uh, and also about this five or six principles you adopt. It's absolutely fantastic. And when it comes to silence, I think when the client was actually uh, trying to do some build up something on what you have done uh, and you really didn't want it and, you know, you protested, but you, you have to be silent sometimes. You cannot really, you know, 
I mean, it has happened in my practice too. There was one building in Koromangala, which I did with uh, had steel, glass and concrete. And this client was, uh, I called me up once the porticos, the seal portico was erected. She said, I want to step it down. And luckily, one of my builder friends called up and told me that this is a wonderful building. Which, so I shared that number with my client and the client was convinced that the portico and the steel structure and the glass was there for near next 10, 15 years when she sold the building, it, the portico and the steel thing is gone. I think the black column pillar is still there. I need to go back and see. So it's wonderful. Uh, now, uh, actually, uh, uh, we invited you as a part of uh, the professional practice. These students are basically uh, practitioners. They have just one review to go and they are registered architects and they are into the field. You know how practice uh, 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 practice process our registration process works in India. It's not so uh, tough like other countries. So it is like pretty easy. You become a licensed architect the day you actually graduate. So uh, so you become a life member if you pay five or 10,000 bucks, I don't know how much it is. So, so uh, whether you have got enough training in your internship or whether you have developed that uh, practice skills during your five years of program, which I have a great doubt. Uh, um, and when you go into actual practice, uh, uh, actually to tell you the fact that I did not get any practical training before I started my practice. So the, I learned a lot from the masons who taught me uh, building up those homes, which I did early homes in, in Velo. Now, my, um, as a moderator, I just want to open up this question to start with, and then I will, uh, 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 we'll open up to the students who will be asking questions. So my um, um, uh, uh, my question to you, or rather, I would like to uh, uh, get a happy. I uh, will be happy to receive a response from you, uh, uh, architect Mentatius. That um, what is uh, of a very critical moment in your practice, like, you know, and there was a time you felt that, you know, come on, I don't want to practice as an architect. I want to get out of it. I mean, this is something terrible, you know. So uh, what is that moment? Have you come across that kind of a moment in your practice? Uh, and uh, I would be happy if you ever had that moment uh, in your practice of so many decades. Uh, and uh, the students would be very keen to hear. Yeah, I'll answer that. Just give me one second. Take it. Okay. I uh, luckily enough, I, uh, I I I don't think so. There are the nine uh, navarasas, as they call it, the nine emotions, and the disgust is called bibatsa. I don't think I've had that moment of that in my practice yet. Anger, yes. Happiness many times, joy, you have all those things. I would probably say that a certain breaking point came about a couple of years ago when I kind of realized that you know, I made a little change in in my path as an architect. And you know, for the last about a couple of years, I've also been doing this thing on uh, digital content and digital delivery. And what predominantly drove that change? That was a change that I would call it. It was so again, a change from hope, not from anger or disgust, was that I kind of realized that as architects, as a community, we are making the same mistakes again and again. Right? And when I speak to the students, I always tell them, it's okay to make mistakes, absolutely fine. As long as you learn from those mistakes and you don't repeat those mistakes again. But somehow as a community, we seem to be making the same mistakes again and again. So I just thought that maybe the answer is in technology. Let technology take care of the drudgery so that then we can at least then go back to our being good creative people. And it is this which created this frustration with the fact that we are making the same mistakes again and again. Somehow, you know, we, we just seem to know how to make water flow the wrong way. We know how to make a mess out of stormwater drainage. We know how to make a mess of window derailing so water comes inside. We know how to make a mess of opening so that sunlight is cut off and you know we, we always have the worst things happening to our building. How is it that we don't learn from our mistakes earlier and why do we keep repeating these again and again? That's been my biggest point of frustration in practice. 
what i want to tell all you youngsters is a be not afraid to experiment right if the experiment goes wrong it's fine trust me when i tell you this a good client will often accept a sincere apology but not one lie if you made a mistake own up to it just go and say i am sorry and this is still one of the principle okay, which i tell my people if you want to screw up apologize for it take responsibility and show what you can do to set it right don't try to push it under the carpet and try to say you know that guy did it you know this girl didn't do it that's the worst thing that you can do so the point of uh, change for me professor jafar was when i realized that we are making the same mistakes again and again and then i'm trying to use technology today to see if we can automate those processes and make sure that we don't do those mistakes so that we go back to our core with this creativity oh thank you um i i i was uh, like i just picked up a point from your statement you say you say sorry to your client and he is okay with it um Uh, I'm not sure. I I have my practice in New Zealand as well, so where we have a very stringent rules of uh, practice laws, and the uh, we have certain documentations that needs to be done, and we of course have the practice insurance, PI insurance, what we call, uh, which uh, which means that uh, any claim by the client, uh, and um, that is uh, you know taken care of there. Uh, but you know what happens is that. Errors to human, which means human is expected to err or make mistakes. That's fine, but mistake at what cost? Whose cost? It's the client's cost. So, so it depends upon that. If uh, how can an architect realize his mistake early in his uh, practice? Like, and if a particular project, he realizes that that's his mistake. okay and does he have to really go and talk to the client or if the client comes to know of it because in indian conditions we really don't stress on the professional indemnity insurance as, as such because in fact in my lectures i have stressed a quite a bit on indemnity insurance which says that uh, uh you it's almost cost like 1000 bucks for 1 lakh of insurance so or uh, on an approximately uh, that is a price that we paid to the insurance company as premium uh, since in the absence because uh, absence of this kind of type of premium even though the council of architecture just mentions one paragraph about professional indemnity um how what is your suggestion about uh, uh, about professional indemnity uh, especially to practicing just architects who start with practice because uh, uh, the practices abroad if you look at the practice laws abroad uh you can see that uh the public is assured and all safety measures are taken care and uh, the agreement that goes through between the architect and the owner where the owner is assured that the uh, the uh, nzrib or for that matter aca can take care of uh the interest of the public now Uh, in the absence of the stringent laws we do have practice uh, laws in council of architecture in the absence of the stringent laws which assures public and that's a reason that many of uh, one of the reasons could be many of them uh, are not just serious about employing an architect they can go to anybody who calls themselves an architect there's a lot of fuzzy architects things that are happening so how do you think one can establish a practice and be protected and also protect his client and be truthful to him so the uh, i i mean uh, it's it's not very difficult to get professional indemnity insurance in india and i'm i'm not sure it's as expensive as you mentioned it professor jafar it's uh, uh, i think it's a lot less uh, than that it's good to have it but you know pressing those claims in india is very difficult because it's kind of really difficult to establish why it happened what happened and all those things so most people rather kind of uh, you know I just solve for just Marty than to go to the uh, you know, trouble of having to uh, go through the insurance process. But you know, mistakes can happen. Okay, just take the famous example of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. In those days, the impact of reverberation was not well understood. 
for this. No, no, sorry, which which bridge is this? The the Vera Sano Narrows Bridge connecting uh, Long Island and uh, and New York, New Long Island and Manhattan. Oh, Very okay. famous uh, story. Oh. The bridge was built. The impact of uh, reverberation driven by wind was not well understood, and. on one disastrous day the with heavy wind the bridge started shaking which triggered reverberation so it kind of just amplified and the bridge collapsed yeah yeah i've seen videos that was completely due to the lack of knowledge in the system on how something works right to me that's a mistake the loss of life and property is not something we can uh, excuse but that was the limit of knowledge at that time it's like saying you know i, I sent the chandra into the moon but as it was landing it it didn't land properly just crashed it's fine i mean to me it's fine cuz there's no other way you, you can experiment with it you really wish that they had kind of perfected it but if that didn't happen well so be it we 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 live to uh, set it right however to to answer your question specifically on how to avoid mistakes i think the only way that you can avoid mistakes is to be a good student which means you got to be willing to learn and to all of you i will say please please be willing to work for a couple of years under a good teacher a good master learn from them there is no other way to learn especially in in, in a context of india where there is so much like uh, professor japa said so much of fuzziness about who can call themselves an architect and what you can do be a good student keep your eyes and ears open there is no other way that you will learn that's how you do it and yeah, despite I, that I, if despite that if a mistake happens believe me there are people who will be trusting and forgiving for that but if you are not true to yourself that forgiveness and trust won't come absolutely i think i totally agree with you that the, uh, the students uh, have to get that a few years uh, into working with somebody whom they like um and you know you they need to work uh, with them uh, uh, and um, uh, that will really really um, you know strengthen the ideas of uh, of the idea of practice and sometimes in small offices you become almost like next to boss where you deal with the client you talk to him you understand him and all this thing in a big offices it might be like a routine structure uh, like that uh, coming back to that kind of a uh, uh, the professional indemnity i was talking about so i'm now i'm going to open up the i'm going to call names of students and they would be ready to ask questions so i want all the students to come on video uh, so that the questions uh, uh, can be directly asked to um, um, uh, uh, professor elvi now the thing is that the, i think you know the story of millennium bridge which was done by foster and then i think um, it was a bridge cross uh, 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 over thames and then the bridge opened up uh, what happened is that uh, uh, it started swaying you know the uh, both ways and so when the people started complaining um, um it was like a dangerous situation like it was not swaying that much like the 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 american one it was like a slight movement as you walk on it people like some people fell off uh so architect was asked i mean norman foster was asked to say what is this such a costly bridge uh such a beautiful bridge it is swaying when some people walk on it's a walkway bridge okay and you know what foster said a wonderful answer it said it is designed to sway you know and he said no it's impossible we can't take up this then arup was employed and they spent five times the cost of the bridge to actually stop swaying so it's they become probably a most expensive uh footprint foot foot bridge probably in london and uh, that's how you know actually of course first i has to had to pay a price for it you know and anyway so what i mean to say is that this whole concept of consumer protection and consumer uh, the labor laws and the kind of uh, practice regulations that are uh, coming in into place uh, uh, hopefully because we are expanding in outside india and the outside architects are going to come here so now that the uk and india have an agreement so people will be flooding uh, architecture market 
for because they are allowed to do business for two years here the visas are given work visas are given so we can also go there but who's going to take us that's a big question so we easily take them but we we can't go to London to open up our offices. So the Council of Architecture must probably listening in this YouTube to understand if they can work with ARB, that there's a mutual agreement between architects flowing from there to there. Uh, probably your uh, big office can open an office there to procure projects. You have wonderfully done huge projects and you have international expertise. So uh, people like you can open up a shop there, you know, and uh, uh, get work. So this is, I don't know if that is going to happen mutually agreeable with them. Anyway, so uh, uh, it, uh, I just wanted to open up the questions. I thought I would call Vincent Davis. Is he here? Uh, Vincent Davis. Uh, uh, Vincent Davis is here. Can you come on video, Vincent? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, I think all the students, can they come on video? Vincent, you've been my student right through three months. I think on and off, you've been present and absent. And uh, can, I, I know your head is, uh, you're an excellent um, architecture student. And you uh, we did give a solid crit yesterday on your project, I think. So uh, you must be having some questions in your mind. Can you ask, uh, uh, Can uh, this is your time, Vincent. Come on, video, please. It's okay if you have a rough head. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, j we just like to hear some more some more points on uh, uh, your early days. You know, right after your undergrad school or early years, because we are just uh, you know graduate. I mean, like we are we are graduating in a couple of weeks, but still we just want to hear more on you know uh, the days and the years of first or second. I mean, like one or two uh, right after your undergrad school. So that's a little uh, uh, different from a normal uh, thing. I mean, first of all, hello, nice to see you after a long time. So uh, <laughs> it's a little different uh, because, you know, I joined a family firm. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I call it technical nepotism, right? Because, I mean, I got my seat through uh, an All India entrance exam in my college at UT. So you kind of join and when you join with uh, in your family firm you join with some privileges so you join with everyone calling you sir and basically afraid to talk to, to, to you and all those things but what happens with that right is a little different except because you're part of the family and firm they expect you to know all answers right i mean you, they just think you're like some freaking genius who's landed there to save the world so everybody thinks that you know all the answers and I remember the story really well. Huh? I mean, thanks for reminding me about it. I was one day called by my boss, who was also my uncle, and said, go to that site and solve the problem. <laughs> I asked him, what is the problem? He says, from my memory, I know that that corner is either a right angle or an obtuse angle. But every time I draw it, from the dimension that the site sends me, my angle turns out to be an acute angle. Go oh, sort it out. So you know what I told him? I said, hey, I'm an architect. I mean, this is a, it's a surveyor's job. Why are you asking me to do it? Ask the survey guy to go do, do a right survey and give me the answer. So my boss said, I'm asking you to do it. Move your ass to site and solve the problem. So I went to site. And trust me, Vincent, I had no idea because that one class that I hated most in undergrad was... Uh, apart from quantity surveying where you multiply LBD, was the survey class. Somehow, this was so stupid to sit to those chains and uh, Dafa will remember it. I don't know what you guys do, but you know, we guys had to actually take those chains and go and sit. Probably Dafa measured uh, uh, College of Engineering. Yeah, 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 we did. Yeah. Yes. We did all this chain age and then you got to do that uh, pole and then, you know, adjust for optical, this thing, correction and all those things. Craziness. So I went to that site and I didn't understand anything, right? And then I figured it out. So what was happening is that the guy who was sending the dimension on the site, right, was measuring the wall. If you see, I just use my finger as the example. He was measuring the horizontal distance outside, outer to outer. Vertical distance, outer to outer, right? But the, imagine my finger is the wall. The wall has a thickness. And that guy was measuring the diagonal inside. He should have measured the diagonal also outside to outside, right? But he was measuring the diagonal inside to inside. It took me about an. It took it just. Took, I, I, I just told him, let's take the measurements again, right? 
So it was actually something, it just took me about three minutes to understand what mistake he was doing. And then quickly at sight, I kind of marked it out and drew it on, on graph paper. And I thought I solved the problem. So, you know, uh, each person has a different experience. You, know, you may join a large office and you may be detailing toilets for two years. It doesn't matter. Or like Professor Jaffa said, you may join a small office and you may be the main designer out there. In fact, once in Anna University at School of Architecture, there's a kid who told me that uh, in his office, he was the only architect, right? Because he joined some contractors firm because nobody else gave him training. So he said, I was doing everything. And in that summer, that guy really grew big. You know? He grew big as a person because in that one summer, he did design, he did contract management, he did quantity, he floated tenders, and he was a site supervisor. Right? So what experience you get is it's immaterial. Make the best of whatever situation you're in, but use your brain. That's the, end of the, that's the only thing that you can do, right? Because I, I told you I was worried about this survey, go to site, try to figure out, but it took me hardly two, three minutes to understand what is going on. Right. So this is this is how it is. And the second thing that will happen to you often is that if your boss realizes that you are even like a half efficient guy, believe me, they will dump responsibility on you. And this again, I remember I went that, you know, that coaching stadium project that you saw, you know, two months into the site, I was made the boss of that site. Right? I was told to run the project. It was crazy, you know, because then I was hardly 30 and I was dealing with all these IPS officers and IAS officers and everybody. I was constantly fighting with people to get things done. And, you know, when, how I realized I'm doing a right job. Again, one day my boss was traveling the train. And those days, the easiest way to go out to Cochin was to take uh, Ernakulam Express, you know, leave in the evening or leave early in the morning. And that night in the train, the MP of Ernakulam was traveling with my boss was also my uncle in the train and they got talking to each other. And then my boss told the guy we are designing the stadium out there. And that they said, you are designing the stadium? I only see one one young young guy in the side. And he said, yeah, that's 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 my nephew. He said, oh, he's doing a good job. So don't come to my side. I don't want you to come to that side. He says, he's doing a good job. Let him do a good job. Don't disturb him. So then that was, I really slept well that night. You know? Finally, I get a, a good so wonderful. So, yeah, so yeah. you know, these are these are things that make uh, the thing. So all that I'm trying to tell you is, you know, somebody may go to an international firm, some of you may go abroad and uh, work, some of you may work in uh, uh, in a village near Velour. Where you are working matters not. How you work matters all. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. don't go out. I mean, this is a pandemic. Unfortunately, you kids are going to be graduating in the middle of the wretched study Chinese pandemic, and you know, trust me. 90% of you are going to be in a place that's going to make you unhappy on day one. But all I have to tell you is, don't be unhappy. You can learn from every single situation you're in. Keep your eyes out for that learning. That is the most important. That's uh, that's wonderful uh, of you to tell us that uh, that kind of, uh, you know, the narrative. Uh, that's beautiful. And, you know, we are even negotiating. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, having a finishing score uh, for uh, some of those graduates who would be very keen to work further with us, uh, employing practicing architects to actually run a studio. Um, uh, with we spark uh, as a part of finishing school, training themselves for the next three months after they graduate to uh, be better equipped for uh, the thing. For example, one of the projects that I'm proposing is um, how to develop an architecture studio within we spark. So that is one of the major projects that is going to come up, and some students will be employed, and they are not free; they will be paid for it. Okay, I assure you, they will be paid for it, and we will take services of people like you uh, to be part of that studio, which will be practice research uh, a cluster is working on it. Okay. Next, Pavita, he comes uh, from a builder's background and uh, uh, he seems to be uh, doing very well in architecture. And uh, we see most of the architecture students come from engineering or builder's background. 
And um, when we try to articulate their life to become better architects, they go back home. I know they have a lot of contradictions, uh, 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 arguments like you had with your boss on many places. Uh, you know, because the way you're talking, I'm sure you had uh, quite a bit of uh, 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 arguments at the beginning of your life and uh, also must be having continued argument with uh, with architecture and the work environment that you so that some of this this cannot be expressed so pavitar is uh, one of the top students we have uh, so pavitar is ready to shoot out a question now yes, sir. good morning sir hello oh, yeah. am i audible yeah 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 you audible how are you Yes, I am very good, sir. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Sir. Nice yes, sir. Nice. So the question that I want to talk to is: uh, so now you are uh, as technology is kind of developing in its part of all our lives in all our professions, and you are also a key. Uh, you are also playing a key role in uh, how technology is taking over architecture. Uh, we we would like to get an insight on what the future is uh, on that aspect. because uh, as we had uh, while we are spending time in our studio design is a very personal uh, process you know you are you are part of all of it even if the way we design has changed a lot uh, we but how we interact with our own design is is very crucial so you were talking a lot about automation and how uh, how we can automate to re reduce the human error now what are the things that we can look for in the near future uh, of how technology will be an integral part of architecture and how it will change our professions sir so if you have any experience about it it will be great to hear it like i told you i don't have a flat screen tv at home still i don't <laughs> have a netflix account yet but you know i was i was exactly your age when my department at uh, rurki got its first personal computer okay it got its first computer personal computer they created a, a computer lab and that was just like basically in any other room with an air conditioner and this computer and that so which year was this which year was that <laughs> this was 1987 87 right okay. so i got this computer in 1987 and uh, it was so i go there and uh, there is this guy sitting and uh, we ask him can we use the computer and he kind of looks at us and says okay and so i asked him i said before it touches i want to know how much does this cost <laughs> And he said it cost cost the university two lakhs of rupees. And I kind of thought and said, God damn it! If I touch it, if anything goes wrong, my dad will have to work for another fifteen years to just pay the cost of this computer. <laughs> so let me not touch this computer, you know. <laughs> and, and and you know what? I'll tell you what is the biggest change that's going to happen. Okay, for this today, if you do any design, right? There was a time when we design we can't conceptualize it fully there is a time when an, when a structural engineer will model something and you know simple bending moments he will understand but complicated calculations they can't do it there is no way that you would understand how fire works in a building if a building catches fire there is no way that you can anticipate how energy actually works you you make all your calculations fancy calculations you say glass is doing this this is the u value this is the light uh, daylighting uh, index component and all those things light transmission lt and all those things you will never know how a building performs so what we lack is data we lack hard data okay and the way technology is changing in 5 years time you're going to be have you're going to be having so much data with you that you can in many ways predict how buildings will behave okay so which basically means that if you say i am going to use exposed brick you can predict how the building will behave you can immerse yourself in uh, ar vr to see how it is you can experience it fully if it's a complicated design your engineer can actually simulate it if it's a high rise if you if you're going to be the first person to design a 200 meter tall tower in chennai then you can actually go or do a proper wind tunnel analysis of how wind is going to affect it you can actually have data from real time sensors that tell you how air conditioning works how electricity works how fire works which basically means that building behavior is going to become a predictive science you don't have to guess anymore you know what that does for you is it helps you to make better decisions 
it helps you to make better choices it will help you to make more opportunities to explain your thinking to your clients and i think that is going to be the biggest change that you're going to be seeing in uh, in, in in what that's going to be the biggest change that you'll see coming in the next couple of years so it doesn't matter what your present technology skills are it's also the nature of technology that more and more of this of this is just going to be happening on the cloud which means you really don't need anything more than a browser to be able to do these things right so that's that's going to be the biggest advantage that you kids have when you step out so you got to be uh, you know you, you just got to be tech savvy about these things and not be like a a, a tech dinosaur like i am I mean, like my my skills are limited to powerpoint and zoom <laughs> but i expect you guys to be a lot more hands on with things thank you uh, lv for that and um, i think uh, it's very nicely put uh, like we have um, um, technology to see how the building performs uh, but there is also very soon we have artificial intelligence ai uh, which will actually read your face to say whether you like this building or not if you are uh, if you're dissatisfied in what way it is dissatisfied with. so the building will actually start talking to you and when you log in the next time it'll say uh, you this is what you felt when you entered this building so what is your problem let me try to resolve it so you see uh, ai is going to play a very significant significant role because the architects have to be very careful before actually actually the design because the building might reject them and which may actually building might come back and say hey like a transformer say so say no we do, I, uh, people don't like it so uh, i think you better uh, should uh, uh, resolve your issues with building so uh, so i think uh, buildings will be speaking to us in the future the way technology is going Uh, no, I know Kostab is uh, waiting, and he's from. He comes from uh, Jamshedpur, the steel city established by Tatars, and um, of course he's uh, right now doing a thesis, which is quite a controversial project. He has uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, I mean, many questions running around his mind. I think um, uh, so. He is there for you, Kostab. Hello, sir. Good morning. Hey, how are you, man? I'm good, sir. How are you? <laughs> So, uh, so these were some thoughts from another series of lectures that I was attending, and uh, so uh, this these were things that an, a second generation landscape architect was really telling us. And uh, so he was he's also had like a long spanning uh, sort of career, like much like yourself. And uh, he was talking about how when he started off, he was designing gardens which uh, mostly had your soft landscape, lawns, grasses, and trees, and uh, very quickly he'd see that his clients would really take them apart and do something else so he sort of changed his style after a while and he started doing these hard structured landscapes with your bridges and pavilions and like uh, so he started calling that landscape architecture the skeleton now uh, my question was really that how important is reinvention in uh, uh, in having a in having longevity in your career if if you would had any episodes like that would you like to share with us um you know the 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 key to reinvention is that the reinvention has to keep you relevant okay now if if the idea of changing from softscape to hardscape was only to make sure no one tinkers with your design then that's that's not my cup of tea because like i said end of the day when you design you also it's a little bit like that uh, you all you i'm sure all of you grew up reading harry potter you know so when uh, uh, harry potter mother gets killed by voldemort a little bit of voldemort sticks to harry and you know a little bit of a uh, little bit of everything is there everywhere else and uh, you know there's one episode in that last book when uh, voldemort wants to kill uh, harry but you know harry's wand protects him and uh, saves saves him from voldemort so you know some it is always your skill that protects you and the skill has to be true to the requirement of the design you know the, the skill is there to to help you you but you can't use that skill to say i will design it in a way that it is inflexible for the for the user i mean if someone ripped out a landscape i would have gone back to ask them why they did that right like i went and asked this guy why did you build that floor without asking me 
expert, something like that. So the the relevance of that is in the fact that your reinvention is to keep you relevant, keep you up to date with knowledge, and keep you up to date with what's happening in the world, right? Which basically means that you can't take your eyes off the ball. I'll, I'll again there's a story in Anna University. There's a lady who's heading the bio biotechnology uh, department, and one day she made a comment saying like, "All your buildings are rectangular, right?" So for the next time she called me for a design, I took a circular building and went. Right? And she said, "Oh my God, a circle! Where's the rectangle?" You know? So I, that was like just such an eye opener to me. You know? I mean, I I was responding to some random comment she made. I was responding to her comment on style. but eventually when we went back to look at it in detail the program determined that the building has to be a rectangle right? so there was no point in my like doing a circle just to keep her happy so you you really got me you know every reinv reinvention of yours has to ensure that your relevance continues in a manner which basically and there's only one test of it right there's only one test which is A client calls you back after a couple of years and says, "Hey, come back and redesign for me." And in that sense, I'll tell you, I'm really happy because I designed two buildings with one client. I had a lot of fights, a huh? lot of fights. For the end of it, I thought, "Okay, I'm done with this guy." And he's from close by to you. He's from Durgapur. So I thought, "I'm, I, I thought I'm done with this guy." And last week, he calls me back and said. You know what? I fought with you so much. I'm sorry. I was immature, but I really like what you did. Come back. Let's work together again. And then there's another guy for whom I designed a very simple building, and he called me back and said, "You know, your approach was very refreshing. Now I'm doing something big and monstrous. Come back to work with me." So you know, it, it uh, your 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 approach to anything cannot be determined by your prejudices. It has to be responsive responsive to what the requirement of that client is. Okay. That's what for her. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Elvi, for to, that. And, somebody has uh, to mute themselves, Jafar. Is there some background noise? Uh, uh, somebody has to mute. Uh, uh, I'll just ask the question. I mean, in the sense that we have um, um, our faculty actually quite, you know, um, waiting to ask a question. Uh, so we have Dinesh Raghavan. You know him well, Dinesh. You have some uh, specific question. Yes, sir. It's just a, it's a small question actually, uh, because I know, sir, uh, Vingreshar has been there for a uh, long years in practice, and they have done a um, lot of projects. Uh, just a small question: How do you deal uh, projects like something related to government-related uh, projects? Because I've seen you have done some libraries, you have done some stadiums, a lot of projects you have done. So the client, the private client versus the government. So I have I re, I have recently had a discussion with one of the architect. I don't want to name the architect here, and uh, he has been sharing his experience in doing government projects. And now uh, he has faced uh, ministers and uh, the other government officials and all. I just I just want to know what is your experience in doing government projects. No. Uh... This is that moment when I wish that uh, this is not recorded or live on YouTube, so that I could use some colorful language. But you'll be surprised, huh? I I would use colorful language for the private sector, not for the public sector, because you know, in in many ways, in many ways, the government is uh, unnecessarily vilified. I mean, rightfully so. But eventually, the the success of a project, right, depends on an individual. not on the on the government at large but by how an individual drives it and in as much as i had trouble on that mount road project with uh, corinthian columns and all those things because of the government i will tell you like uh, the stadium project or even tidal park for instance worked perfectly because there was one person who was in charge of it and that person was absolutely focused believe me you could take the case of nehru stadium in chennai that was done demolishing the old structure through the first game played there was 7 and a half months it's kind of an impossible thing to think of it and again like tidal park i'll tell you from the day of digging the digging was sometimes started after monsoon in 1998 and 
on the uh, 2nd of July or 4th or 4th of July 2000, the building was inaugurated by the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister. And that was like how much? Two basements, 13 floors, something like about 1.2 million square feet in about 15, 16 months. And when I say complete, complete in all respects, transformer, DG, AC, access control was activated. So let's not get into a situation and make either the government or governments, ministers and other villains because sometimes they are really good. Same time, I know people in the private sector who were total idiots. And I just used to think like, how the hell did these guys even survive? Because they are just so negative, so anti-progress, and just looking for themselves and not for anything else. So uh, it is tough. There is corruption involved. There are other bad things, but it, it, it also gives you a lot of opportunities because, you know, in India today, government is a, is a big player in the market. So there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you. Uh, LB, can we have another five minutes or so? Is it sure. all right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I know that it's, it's, it's stretching more the time plan. So we just have one question last, probably from Namrata. Do you have a question, Namrata? And then um, we uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we can conclude the show. And, uh, yeah. Well, um, Namrata, please go. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, what, according to you, can be changed or added or maybe taken out from the education system that we have right now, part, so that it it will be more helpful for them when they get up. Yeah. So you got to uh, first of all, hello, nice seeing you after a long time. So the uh, uh, my answer is a non non pandemic era answer. Okay, means it, it can't work now, but I yeah. hope you all still have some time to come back to college and take your class photo and graduate and you know, throw your caps in the air and do all those things. But if there's one thing I'll change, it is that I'll take you out, all out from the comfort of your Gandhi block and dump you into the construction site next door. You know, I will see how much mud is in your fingernails and how dirty your shoes are and give you marks according to that. And that is going to be the biggest learning that you guys have because you have to learn how to correlate your drawings to the site. You know, I keep saying it though. You know, you know how I judge whether someone is doing the work or not at site, right? I go and look how dirty their shoes are. And then I know that that person has gone to site and done their work. And like that, when I, when I, I mean, I can't see it now because you guys use a lot of computers, but I learned this from my professor, you know. He said, depending on how much pencil mark or ink is in your fingers, I know whether you've been working or not. Right? <laughs> so that's about it. I'll, I'll, I'll pick your whole class and dump you in the construction site and say, go learn. You know, that's what I'll do. Yeah. Uh, thank you, LB, for this wonderful answer. Actually, uh, LB, I, uh, we are developing uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, WISPARC uh, uh, into more kind of a practice-based uh, school. Uh, so that is what uh, we are aiming at in future, and uh, definitely uh, people like um, experienced people I'll, in practice like fact, you. I'll, I'll say one more thing to Namrata. You know, going to site and getting your shoes dirty has another advantage. When I when I go back and I'm sitting in the airport, and someone that I don't want to talk to comes to me, I lift my shoes and show it, keep it like this, pointing in that person's direction. You know. I just and then they, they go away so, from me. So the students can do the same thing when they come to the lecture class. Yeah, but you won't but you don't <laughs> give marks. So if they don't want the lecturer, they can take the shoes and show it to him. And then this lecturer would say, Oh my god, it's so dirty. I'm going to run away. Guys, go and wash up your feet and come back. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's so wonderful. This school is also going to towards a little bit of direction. You know that we have a practice research cell which has become very active. And then uh, to tell you the fact that we have recently collaborated with a Chennai firm to do an international competition where our uh, 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 faculty and students participated and they have just submitted last week and they have done wonderful work. 
uh, once the practice, I mean, sorry, the competition um, uh, results are announced, um, um, oh, uh, we will be sharing it in social media. Till then, it has to be a secret document. Uh, so uh, just to tell you that it is just the beginning and we are establishing a very strong practice cell. Uh, probably we'll have an architect's office um, uh, within VSpark very soon. And that is our vision too. And uh, to establish this, we would like to have a very um, 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 uh, strong relationship uh, with practitioners like yourselves, uh, because we might be interested to join you uh, if you have any competition to be uh, uh, done. Like for example, there are quite a number of railway stations are going to be uh, coming up uh, proposed by the government of India. And then, you know, railways is also going to be privatized soon. Uh, so there will be a lot of railway station developed. And then since you have very good government link in case you want to collaborate with us and participating in any competition of such. So we'll be more than happy to collaborate with you, uh, LB in future yeah. and uh, we are very co cool about it and you know we also pay the uh, uh, consulting architects who support us in competition and our management has approved uh, given us a free hand to involve practices in fact uh, today's lecture links have been sent to our chancellor and yeah uh, um, um, uh, and a vp and he's so happy that we are engaging practitioners and uh, we want, uh, I know practitioners were involved earlier before I came, but uh, we want to take it to a next level. We want to take it to a next level doing huge master plans, city level urban interventions, or even small projects. So this is where we can strengthen our faculty to uh, be more closely to practice because practice or perish is, uh, is something which we, I personally believe in, and I also have been writing quite a bit on uh, uh, practice before you preach. So uh, that is something which will bring in a lot. In fact, the student feedback from this particular batch, uh, they have stressed the importance of faculty practice. Uh, I got the student feedback to so tell you that the student themselves, I think Namrata might have um, um, contributed to that. And then, you know, the practice and practicality of the faculty is very important in our studios as well. So that's wonderful. And I must tell you that we are almost uh, coming to a conclusion because uh, I have been sitting here without uh, power. So my, my laptop is also going almost dead in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, uh, that's part of the life that you have to face. Uh, so it was such a wonderful experience. Uh, this is a second lecture. We had Dinesh Verma uh, in the first lecture. You was, this is the second lecture. And it's a, such a wonderful experience. Uh, um, your lecture was so uh, an eye-opener. It was very inspirational and a lot of young, excited minds. And uh, we, of course, we had some very good questions and discussions. And it was wonderful to have you. And we will definitely be have a long-term relationship with you and your company or the firm. And uh, that will help us enrich our practice research education and uh, program at our school. Thank you, LV, for all your uh, time you. and uh, presence here with my students. And uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, so now I, I, the... I leave it to Deepika. Yeah, best wishes to the students for the thesis. And thanks. I look forward to being back and working with you all. And, and if time permit, uh, I can send you an invitation as an observer. You can yes. bump in and drop sure. by and drop out anytime. So I want sure. Madhumati, if she is here, uh, if she is there or such, uh, so Madhumati, you're still there. Are you Madhumati? Yes, sir. Oh, you look so different. Did you have your hair cut? <laughs> uh, okay, you look so different. Okay, now you're better because of the lighting problem. So I think you should send an invitation to LV uh, to be a uh, I want him to be a, 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 what do you call, a thesis assessor or whatever it is. And he's given free hand to just go around all the panels anytime. And of okay. course, the time that he contributes also to be noted. And uh, you just prepare a document and we'll shoot out an email to him. So we, are, we welcome you, LV. Uh, there are, this goes on only one day. You can just got to keep yourself morning session free to go in and go out, look at what is happening. We can bump in and say a comment and go to another room and then do all that. So it will be wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you'll, Deepika. You'll get it, Kaustab. Don't worry.
Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for a wonderful session. Uh, uh, for the last, uh, I request uh, Vincent to give a formal vote of thanks. Uh, I feel special and honored right now uh, to thank uh, architect L. Venkatesh. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, and very insightful presentation, sir, and has given us, you know, a much needed clarity on, you know, the real life practice, uh, uh, you know, uh, in architecture. And uh, I'm sure me and my peers are much more confident now in the transition from, you know, academic setup to a professional setup. I, I believe so. And uh, I thank you once again. Uh, and I like I take this opportunity to thank our director, you know, for his continuous efforts and uh, to ensure that we as students get to learn from the best from the best in the industry. Uh, you know, I would like to also thank the coordinators and the volunteers, without whom this event would not even be possible. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to thank all the participants uh, and the faculties, you know, who joined for taking their time and uh, you know. Uh, enjoying the event uh, uh, to make a grand success. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Victor, sir, for being here. As always, it has been a pleasure having you here, and we are certainly looking forward for more uh, such occasions, and we will definitely be happy to have you once the college like, reopens. Like, yeah, please like, please like, send like, him the recording link like, as well. Like, huh? like, we'll Arnold, do so. like Arnold Schwarzenegger famously said, I will be back. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, uh, according to Jaffa, it is, we will get you back. Got it. Right, okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Have a great day and have, week have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you very much.